This is a Breeze Audio TPA3116 mini power amplifier which uh, I purchased off of AliExpress for about $24. Now, they didn't seem to be available at that price at the time of shooting this video, but uh, the Breeze Audio thing seems to be referring mostly to this case. And this really seems to be a new up and coming thing about among the uh, Chinese uh, mini amp manufacturers because you seem to be able to get this in many varying va varieties. And you can even just purchase the vanilla case for about the same price I paid for the entire thing. But uh, uh, this particular amplifier I've taken some interest in because it was so cheap and uh, I figured it would be quite representative of the current generation of Chinese Class D amplifiers. So I've taken a quite uh, varying suit of measurements on it and I figured we would have a look. Uh, before we do though, uh, here's just a quick overview of the actual device. The case is quite nice called it's uh, extruded aluminium on the sides which just uh, pops together, top part, lower part, with uh, two plates in the front which are just screwed into the, the extrusions. Uh, the power switch is mounted directly onto the PCB, it's not mounted to the case and there's a little hole for the power LED there, a red one. Uh, the volume knob is very nice on this one, it's an actual aluminium knob which is screwed onto the potentiometer and it's got a very, very good feel for one of these. Uh, in fact it almost feels like a real proper quality amplifier to be honest. Around the back uh, it has a quite uh, nifty output arrangement with these very proper looking speaker terminals which actually fit normal 4mm banana plugs if you want to. And that's just beautiful. These plugs can be had on, from China for very cheap so that really makes connecting everything together a breeze. Power input is a normal input jack and that's one of the things that make the TPA3116 a quite interesting chip because it will run on supply voltages up to about 24 volts which means that you can just grab your generic old broken laptop power adapter to power this thing and achieve quite considerably more output power than you get uh, out of a 12 volt power supply amplifier like the good old Lapai LP2020. And uh, the tests I've done certainly confirm that. So, with no further ado, let's have a quick look at the measurements. And here are the test results for the Breeze Audio TPA3116 amplifier uh, as powered by a 90 watt, 19 volt laptop power adapter. So, uh, we have a noise floor of uh, about minus 66, 67 decibel volts, which is uh, not very good. It's about on par with the ever famous Lapai and uh, quite typical for this class of amplifier. A proper hi-fi amplifier would be uh, about 10 decibels quieter, so this is a relatively hissy amplifier, but for most people who aren't too picky or sit a bit away from the speakers, it isn't going to be of any consideration whatsoever. It's a perfectly acceptable result. Uh, the 8 of band noise, uh, which is the amount of crap a Class D amplifier puts out above the audible spectrum, i.e. stuff you cannot hear, but still comes out through your speakers, uh, is about 50 millivolts. And uh, that's an acceptable figure. Uh, if you have too much out of band noise, it could actually damage your speakers, uh, but uh, this is acceptable by far. Uh, the signal to noise ratio of the amplifier is 89.2 decibels, uh, I don't like the SNR specification because it's very misleading. It compares the peak output power of the amplifier to the amount of noise it puts out while it's sitting idle with the volume at the bottom. And uh, that's not a very normal use case scenario at all. But everybody uses it, so this is a useful number to compare this one to other amplifiers. The gain of the amplification is 31.6 decibels, which is quite high. You can hook a quite low, weak signal source into the amplifier and still get a lot of output, which is useful, but it does have a downside of giving you a higher noise floor or decreased signal-to-noise ratio. The damping factor of the amplifier, which is essentially how strongly it's able to drive your speakers, uh, is about 30, and that's not a very good result. Uh, most Proper hi fi amplifiers aim to have at least a hundred, very good ones have upwards of a thousand. 
uh, but 30 is absolutely usable, it's fine. If anything this is going to give you a bit of tube sound because the tube amplifiers have a very low damping factor, often below 10, but this is not something which is going to be of any problem for your normal mid-range uh, consumer. Uh, the frequency response I measured in this case was 9Hz to actually about 40kHz, this is wrong. Uh, and uh, that's absolutely fine. Uh, a note about the high frequency performance is that it ha this amplifier has very high distortion, above 10 kilohertz. We're talking upwards 1% of THD plus N, and uh, that indicates that something's done a bit cheaply in it. Uh, whether or not the distortion is audible is questionable, since most of the distortion is going to be above 10 kilohertz and most people's hearing starts to become a lot less reliable above 10 kilohertz. So again, I wouldn't class the, the distortion at the high frequencies as a huge problem, but it is there and it is a signal purity issue. The signal going out of the amplifier is quite considerably different from the signal going into it and that's a bad thing. Uh, the maximum channel mismatch uh, was about 0.3 decibels and that's uh, uh, not really a horrible result. Uh, you can probably, in certain cases, notice that one channel is going to be slightly louder than the other, uh, but yeah, 0.3 decibel is definitely an acceptable result, especially given the price range of the amplifier. Uh, the efficiency, nothing to complain about. Uh, 88 to 91 percent of efficiency, very good. Class D performance, as you'd expect. Uh, a lot more efficient than your old timey linear amplifier. Conserves power, runs along battery. Just a good spec. Now, what everyone was waiting for is the power output. So, while being run on just a generic laptop power adapter from 2006, uh, this amplifier put out 21.6 watts into 8 ohms at its specified uh, distortion level of 1%. And that's uh, very good indeed for the price point. Uh, again, I need to compare it to the Lapai LP2020, uh, which puts out about 5 watts per channel into 8 ohms at its best. So this is quadruple power improvement, and that's definitely not a bad thing. That's four times more power for, well, in my case, the same price, but the going rate for these amplifiers at the moment seems to be about $40 but that's still four times more power for double the price, and that is not bad. The power at a more strict 0.3% THD plus noise and it was just about 21 watts as well, so it's quite clean all the way up until it starts clipping. Uh, at 10% THD plus N, which is a heavily clipped and distorted signal, it have got about 26.6 watts into the amplifier, which is about what you'd expect. It's a voltage limited output limit, i.e. it's purely limited by the fact that we are only putting in 19 volts into the amplifier. If we were to power this amplifier from a higher supply voltage, say 24 volts, we're going to see a much higher power output, and I have done a test on that as well, so you're about to find out. The 4 ohm power output performance was very poor on this particular amplifier because it overheats almost instantaneously. The maximum power output I was able to reliably manage was about 20 watts per channel and even then it wasn't performing very well. Uh, but uh, during short bursts it did manage a quite respectable 36.5 watts and that's uh, really getting into the realm of a old uh, home stereo as you'd buy in something like the 90s for a few hundred dollars, so that's certainly not a bad result. But uh, the continuous performance at this power level simply doesn't exist because it overheats and goes into tick mode where it will start cutting out the sound, cooling down, turning on, playing for a second, cutting out and so forth. Uh, it also had relatively high distortion levels above about 27 watts. As we can see by the fact that the 0.3% specification only allows for 26.92 watts of output power. Uh, that uh, hints at the IC, which is obviously going to be a Chinese copy of the TPA3116, isn't of the best quality. 
I also noticed during testing that the distortion levels for the two channels are quite uh, different across the board. So this definitely has a bad copied chip in it. Moving on with the 4 ohm output power though, at 10% distortion, i.e. very hard clipping, we managed 44 watts, which is sits almost 50 watts, and it's a quite considerable amount of output power. And here are the same figures for the 24 volt power supply. Everything up here is going to be practically the same, these characteristics don't change much with the input voltage. However, the output power has now increased to over 30 watts into 8 ohms, or over 50 watts into 4 ohms during short peaks until the amplifier overheats. But these figures really are starting to put it in a quite respectable power output category. Because again, we are talking about the same price range as a LePi, but 6 times more output power. And uh, 30 watts is very loud. It's not something you'd normally use in any non-party situation, really. And uh, the absolute peak power I got out of it was 64 watts into 4 ohms. And, well, that's just... <laughs> that's just a lot of power for your money, I have to say. Uh, but the issues with overheating remained at 4 ohms, of course, so I really would not advise using this amplifier to drive 4 ohm loads at all, ever. So with this in mind, it might be worth purchasing a 24 volt power supply to go with this amplifier, because you really do gain uh, power output linearly with your input voltage. Uh, a 24 volt uh, 4 or 5 amp power supply should work excellent with this device, but if you're fine with 21 watts of output power, which I think you really should be, uh, a 19 volt, 90 watt laptop power adapter is going to give you excellent performance as well. So for boring paperwork out of the way, let's uh, just try and have a look inside the amplifier to see what the actual build quality is like. So the amplifier just comes apart with two screws, two hex heads in front and two Phillips heads in back. Once those are out, the top part of the case just lifts off and reveals some quite sparse internals. To actually get the PCB out, you also need to undo two more, the two lower Phillips head screws down there, as well as the 1.5mm hex head holding the volume knob in place. So let's go through the stuff we actually have on the board. So over here we've got a bank of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 470 microfarad, 25 volt rated caps, uh, which are Sanyo branded, but they are very obviously clones. And over here we've got five uh, Panasonic cloned 1 microfarad capacitors, probably serving as some kind of input coupling. That's a design issue I quite strongly noted about this, this heatsink will get extremely hot. You know, I've measured it at well over 120 degrees Celsius, and these capacitors basically get as hot as the heatsink. So if you play this amplifier for very late, for very long, these capacitors are going to be gone. Over here in the lower right corner of the board, we have the power switch, which is just soldered onto the board with no other mechanical reinforcements, as well as the power LED just kind of bent over to fit into and hold above the power button. A bit ugly, but it works. The power button, as you can see, is not connected to the actual main supply of the amplifier, but rather it's using the power off functionality of the amplifier chip to just disable the chip instead of cutting all the power. The advantage of this is that you gain life out of the switch and they can use a lower rated switch to cut the power. If there isn't really anything wrong with that, the amplifier chip is intended to work that way. In the top right part of the board we have the volume control, which isn't one of those ultra cheap Chinese pots, but it seems to be of actually reasonable quality. It's got good feel to it and as the channel mismatch test in the previous segment revealed, it isn't horribly non-linear either, so it seems to be a relatively good quality potentiometer. Under the red heatsink, which is quite decent size actually, 
uh, we've got the chip, we're going to take a look at that later, and on the other side we've got the 8-bit filter for quite big chokes and a quite generous number of capacitors. I've seen TPA3116 based amplifiers which just omitted half of these caps, so that's not bad at all. And the low amount of 8 of band noise really speaks for the fact that this filter does a decent job. If we flip the board over, there isn't much to see. There's a big cutout in the board where the speaker plugs go, and there's basically just a couple of input traces going there and a lot of power coupling going on there. Uh, the general layout of everything is a bit messy with this trace just kind of snaking over there and the caps being kind of in parallel really dodgily and the trace just kind of going over there instead of merging all of it, but these are minor issues, the performance of the amplifier is obviously good enough. We also got a thermal pad it seems for the amplifier chip there and a few bodge capacitors to make everything nice and stable and filtered, uh, they do seem to be intended to go there since we have actual silkscreen for them, so I'm not really sure why they didn't design them in on the top side of the board since there's plenty of space to go around. Perhaps they're just very closely following some design recommendation about where to place these particular caps in relation to the actual physical amplifier chip, in which case I have to commend the designer, if not then well, general Chinese bodgery, what do you expect? It also is worth noting that the case is actually connected to the signal ground through this soldered on little jumpy there. And that's not a bad thing at all, because then you actually have a grounded case to shield the amplifier from external EMI. I quite like that attention to detail, I wouldn't expect it. And uh, again, moving back to the lapai, that one doesn't do it. So, big thumbs up to the designer of this board for and just choosing to add that little extra. Look at the heatsink off and have a bit of a look at the amplifier IC itself. I actually haven't taken this off before, so it's going to be a bit interesting. And they have used thermal paste, and we don't have too much stuff going on under the heatsink at all, really. Yeah, we just have a few resistors configuring stuff and a couple of little surface mount capacitors. Uh, of note uh, are um, really only these two resistors, which are the gain configuration resistors, which uh, are at 100k and 39k, and they do indeed configure dev the device to be set to 32 decibels of gain, which is just about what we measured in the performance check, so that works out just fine. If you wanted less gain, you could just uh, reconfigure these resistors, the proper values are available in the datasheet. And that could be done in order to lower the noise floor, but uh, changing them wouldn't bring any other advantages, really. The chip itself uh, is actually branded TI somewhere, but uh, I really doubt it's a genuine chip. If it is a genuine chip, it is going to be one of the bad ones which they were going to throw away, but then some Chinese guy dumpster dived and found it. So there you go, that's a quick little look at the Breeze Audio TPA3116 Mini Power Amplifier. And uh, I hope it's helped you uh, if you're considering purchasing one of these. If you're looking for a verdict from me, I would say that this is a very good value for money amplifier if you pay less than $40 for it. There really isn't much to complain about, save for the uh, somewhat undersized cooling abilities, but it's difficult to get good cooling into a case of this size. And as long as you're using 8 ohm speakers, this thing is well, it's just going, going to rock your socks off, to be brutally honest. So. Thank you for watching, cheerio, and remember, the full performance reports are available in the video descriptions if you are curious to really dig into the performance of it. And another thing to note is that you can get these with different innards, so it might be a bit difficult sourcing one with a particular PCB. These two boards have dual TPA3116s on them, but the same size heatsink as this one, so might be a bit dodgy, but we might take a look at those in the future. Just be wary if you're buying one of these, but the Breeze Audio thing is just the case. The innards can be absolutely anything. So, go figure. Cheerio.